Hello everybody, it is again time for your Wednesday dose of GIS education. Um, we are today continuing our uh, discussion of quantitative imagery analysis uh, in GRASS GIS and we'll be working again in project 4 which is the same map set that we were working in last time. So the same set of Landsat imagery that we were looking at we can use again uh, this time. And just to recap a little bit we'll just take a look at uh, some of the things that we did. For example our NDVI image that we made of Northern Jordan that tells us something about the health of the vegetation um, in this part of the region. Uh, also, if you remember, we did uh, a couple of things like pan sharpening, and we did our variety of RGB uh, uh, displays for different uh, bands of the satellite imagery uh, so that we could actually see some of the patterning that's going on with the different kinds of materials and their reflectance values. So this time what we're going to do is to instead of use our minds to interpret and our eyes to interpret the patterning we're going to let the computer do some of that for us. And uh, I'm going to, uh, before I do this, I'm going to quickly zoom in just to a, a sort of smaller area of northern Jordan here. In fact what I'm going to do is zoom in even tighter on just this part of the valley right here. And I'm going to set my region to match this stuff just by clicking here, set computational region extent from display. And the reason I'm doing this is just because the patterns will be a little bit clearer at a, a tighter zoom like this as they emerge, but also it'll be easier on my little laptop here that I'm running uh, these examples for you uh, on. So let's talk a little bit about classification again. We talked about it yesterday in class. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're going to feed all the different bandwidths of light, our different bands that we see uh, here when we uh, look 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, right? These are all different bandwidths of light, red, green, blue, infrared, that's sort of near infrared, shortwave infrared, uh, thermal, another shortwave infrared, and then this is panchromatic, which is technically between um, green and infrared. So, I'm sorry, I should have said this is blue, green, red. Uh, I sort of misspoke there a little bit ago. Um, but we're going to feed it any, any combination of those bands we want, and then the computer will try and figure out similar areas, just like we talked about in class. And this, as I mentioned in class, this is sort of a two-part um, back and forth style of analysis. First, you got to generate the spectral signatures with something called k-means clustering, and then you got to feed those spectral signatures into a, a classifier. We're going to use a maximum likelihood classifier, which I talked about in class the other day. And the maximum likelihood cl classifier is then going to find the similar pixels in different parts of all different parts of this image here that uh, that match the signature. And uh, as you might imagine, all of these tools are going to be found in the imagery submenu here. So we're going to go to imagery, and then we have this whole submenu called classify image, and that's basically where we're going to live for this tutorial, this practicum. We need two tools. We need i.cluster, cluster input for unsupervised classification. Remember, unsupervised is letting the computer come up with those signatures. So we'll open that up, and we'll put it over here. And then we're going to go back to the imagery menu, go back to classify image, and then we're going to find maximum likelihood classification. That's our classifier. And we're going to put that over here. So as I mentioned, this is an iterative process, meaning it will produce different results every time you run it a little bit. And also you have to sort of judge the outputs for yourself and figure out what the computer actually came up with and figure out whether or not it's reasonable. So you're going to have to do this a few times and your results will probably be different than the ones that you see here on my screen depending on if you zoom in or if you do the whole map or exactly where you zoom in and even just because there's a little bit of stochasticity of randomness built into this thing. 
okay? So before we run this thing, we need to do something um, a little silly, which is to define what's called an imagery group. And the reason why we need to do this is because we have all these different bands of imagery. And we need to tell Grass that these things are actually part of the same multi-band image. And, uh, you know, to analyze all of them together instead of one on its own, all right? And that's pretty simple to do. Again, from the imagery, the very first thing, develop images in group, create edit group. We get this little window that pops up. Um, there may be a couple of existing groups in here because sometimes Grass makes them automatically. Uh, but what we're going to do is to actually make a brand new one. So we're just going to go down to this thing that says add. And in fact, what we can do is now we see a list of all the raster maps that exist in my map set and we can add the imagery to it. And I'm going to add everything including band 8 which is the panchromatic image. Okay, we'll click OK. And uh, what we can do is click here and type a name. I'm going to call this NJ LSAT. I should have done the name first and then done this before. Sorry about that. So click, write the name first, and then click the add and add all of your Landsat images. Now don't add anything else, not the NDVI, not the pan sharps or whatever else you have in there, just the Landsat raw bands one through eight. Um, and then we're gonna hit apply, hit yes. Now we still need to do one more thing. We need to create a subgroup here. And the reason this is is that we've told it that all the bands are part of the same imagery set, but maybe we don't want to analyze all the bands all the time. So you can make as many subgroups, sub combinations of the bands that you want underneath it. And our classifier and everything in the background is going to need a subgroup. So we're going to call this one um, B1 underscore seven, so bands one through seven. And in fact, that's exactly what we're gonna select. One, two, three, four, five, six, which is the thermal and seven. And we just don't wanna, in this case, add the band eight, because remember, it's the black and white panchromatic, so it's kind of duplicating the data that's already in bands two, three, and four. Um, so at this point, we'll hit apply again, and it says it was successfully changed, and we hit okay. Now, we should be able to go into our i cluster, i dot cluster, and select our imagery group, njl set, and our subgroup that we just created, b1 underscore 7. So this is saying, okay, we're going to deal with all of these Landsat images in that group, but we're only going to deal with this subgroup, which is bands 1 through 7. Okay? Now, you need to create here a, a name for the signature file, the spectral signatures. So I'm actually going to call this b1, b1 underscore 7, sorry, spec, so for spectral signatures, right? Um, if we click on the settings tab, we have a couple of things that we're going to have to deal with. Um, the first thing we're going to deal with is this one right here, initial number of classes. Remember I told you you can tell it, the only thing you can really tell it to do is how many kinds of things you think exist. So let's start with a pretty big number. Let's just start with 10 kinds of things, 10 kinds of reflecting things on the landscape. And it will try and parse out the landscape into 10 kinds of things. You don't typically have to mess with this, this one, sampling interval. These ones down here, maximum number of iterations, percent convergence and cluster separations. You may, well, we will actually mess with those a little bit, but not at the moment. We're going to come back to these kind of things in a little bit. And we don't really need to deal with this minimum number of pixels in a class uh, for our purposes here. The only other thing we have to do is to click Optional and Name for Output File Containing file Final Report. We need this. This is going to be a little text file. It's going to tell us some statistics about what the clusters actually are. So if we need to figure out what the computer decided was similar, this is our only little piece of evidence besides the graphical map that we're eventually going to make. So we're going to just call this spect sig file.txt. It's going to save it in your home folder, your maybe my documents, or just, you know, the, the most base directory in your computer. 
The other thing is, I told you this is iterative, so we're going to want to check at the moment, allow files to, uh, to overwrite existing files. So we're going to hit run. It's going to go very quickly, and nothing's going to happen. No map is created or anything like that, because all it did was create that spectral signature file. So before we do the second part, it's useful for us to just have a look at that file. And so you hear here, you see here, this is my root home folder, you know, and just put it here, specsig.txt. And I open it up in my favorite text editor, and you see um, a variety of things inside of here. Firstly, it just tells me the bands, the images that I input, the subgroup, and tells me the order that they're put in, all right? Uh, it tells me something about the, the region that I set it to. Uh, and then it tells me what I told it, 10 classes and uh, percent convergence, the, all that kind of stuff. So that's really useful stuff here. Um, it tells me the sample size was 10,000 points. It determined that because we didn't mess with that. That's the sort of random initial points it used to figure out basically what's similar. Here's the initial means in those random sample points. And then if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, we see actually the means across all the different bands for each class. So class one that it came up with had a mean in band one of 30, mean in band two of 39, and mean in band three of 47, a mean in band four of 133, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's how you read this right here. Band one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, going that way. And each one of these is one of my 10 classes, I told it. And you see these things here. So basically, the larger the number in this slot here, the larger the influence of that band on the, the configuration of this particular cluster. In this case, we have darkish values for most things, right? So remember, 0 to 255 is our max. Uh, so things that are close to 0 are light, and things that are close to uh, 255 are going to be dark in our in our input image. Okay, so that's going to be helpful for us later on. But let's continue with the routine and actually generate the map. So we're going to go over to our IMAX like over here, and we're going to pick our same image group NJ underscore LSAT and our same subgroup B1 to 7. And now we need to pick that signature file that we made over here before. So if you, I'll just go back and show you under our um, settings tab, our required tab, sorry, where we made the spectral signature file here. We're just going to select the same one. And here, finally, we're going to have our map. So we're going to have um, LSAT unsoup class. You can name it whatever you want, but this is helpful for me to know this is an unsupervised classification. And really, that's the only thing that we need. We're, we're going to check this overwrite um, output files again, because remember, we're going to do this multiple times. So now we can hit run. It's going to take those spectral signatures we were just looking at, and it's going to class up the map. And this part may take a little bit of time, depending on the speed of your computer, the size of the input window uh, region that you're trying to deal with, and the number of classes and a few other things. So. On my little laptop here, it's going to take a little while. On the desktop computers in the lab, this may go actually very quickly. So let's see what it does. Almost done. And... Okay, so there is our output. By default, it's going to apply the Veridis color scheme, which I think is a terrible color scheme for this kind of classification. So the first thing I'm going to do is to right-click on it, set color table, go to the define tab, the name of color table, and I'm actually going to, for this particular one, because these are independent categories, I'm going to find uh, random, and it's going to just hit run. It's going to randomly apply colors to the different um, categories. Now, this is going to look crazy at first. It's going to be really helpful to add a raster legend at this point. And so we'll hit OK, and we'll see our uh, output raster legend over here. In fact, you know, to make your life easier, what you might want to do is to, at this point, make your font look nice. We're going to set it to be white. Um, I'll just set the font to be 12. And then actually under um, Advanced tab, we're going to click the Do Not Show Category Numbers. We just want to see the 
the labels. So in that case, we just see all our classes right there. And this particular color scheme that was randomly generated uh, has too many reds in it, so I'm just going to hit run again. It's going to give me a totally different random color scheme. And I'll just hit that until I see something that looks kind of nice. Maybe one more time. All right. Now things are starting to look a little different. The problem is 10 classes is too many classes. That's really the problem. We're not really seeing very much detail here. So if I zoom in on, like, let's say this area here, I can start to see some differentiation. So remember, if we look underneath this, what are those things, right? So let's, in fact, put our NDVI that we know has something to do with vegetation. And we're going to see, oh, those things are farm fields, right? Farm fields under there. And it looks like my classifier is classifying some of the farm fields, but there's too much noise going on. Ten classes is probably too many classes. So what do I want to do? Well, what I'm going to do, actually what I'm actually going to do first is to just zoom in again. I'm going to set my region uh, just a little tighter so things go faster when we, do, when we want to deal with it. And uh, what we're going to do is go back to our classifiers, right? Go back to our oops, classification routine. So we're going to go back to iCluster. We're going to go to the Settings tab. And we're going to make just a fewer number of classes. Let's try eight. And then we're going to go, apparently, I'm killing off all of my things because I clicked the wrong button that says close when they're done. So let me, let me bring those things back again to classify image, I cluster, put that over here, and uh, imagery, classify image, I max like over here. And so we'll set these things up again. Uh, so this is what I, I check close dialog unfinished. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, we're going to pick our imagery group again, our subgroup. We're going to pick our signature file. We're going to change this to 8. Um, we're going to go to Optional, Overwrite, and we're going to put our the name of our output file, which was um, specsigfile.txt. OK. So we're going to hit Run over here. There we go. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to reset over here our group and our subgroup, pick our signatures, and we're going to pick our same unsupervised classification map to overwrite, which we're going to check here. We're going to hit run. And hopefully now that I've zoomed in a little tighter, this is going to go quicker. Yep, there we go. And so we will see. There we go. OK, so now we actually only have eight subclasses. And things are looking a little neater here. I think, actually, we can go a little tighter. I think eight might be too many somewhere. It's getting closer. It's getting better. But let's try going down to six. And we'll hit Run. And that goes real quick. And we'll go back to our Max-like. We'll hit Run again. And then we'll wait to see what happens when only six uh, classes are defined. Ah, OK. Now things are starting to look clear, right, with just six classes. The farm fields and all that stuff are looking nicer. Our vegetation up here and our classes up here in the hills are looking nicer. And if we sort of go back and forth with our NDVI, we're starting to see some good patterning between the two. So I'm pretty satisfied with six. Uh, but we need to fine tune our analysis now. And this is where we're going to go back to our um, I cluster. And we're going to go to the settings tab and we're going to deal with a couple of these things. So we'll talk about what they mean. So maximum number of iterations is simply the maximum number of time that uh, grass is going to run through the clustering routine trying to get the best result. By default, it's set at 30. 
this can be increased dramatically. I'm in fact going to increase it to about a thousand. And the reason why I'm increasing this is that we want to let it play out naturally to get to the maximum, the maximal solution or the most uh, separated solution where the clusters have the least amount of overlap. These two numbers here are going to help us achieve that. Percent convergence means essentially at what l confidence level are we going to stop iterating the procedure. And essentially a 98 percent confidence level is pretty good. If we want to go even better we can increase this to 99. I do not recommend going up to 100 because maybe you'll just keep trying and it'll flip be in, in a situation where it's flipping back and forth between two pretty good solutions but never getting to exactly 100 so you'll never narrow in on one of them. And then we have the cluster separation. Now this is sort of a quote unquote magic number meaning it's going to be different for every time you do this with different groups of imagery and all this kind of stuff. Essentially this is a, a little bit of a uh, a way for you to tune the the niceness of the output and what I mean by that is to make it a little cleaner right so you don't want to leave it at zero leaving it at zero means it will basically run through it'll come up with a solution but there'll be some noise in there um, if you increase this number too much it's actually not going to come up with the solution that you want and it'll usually find a fewer number of clusters They'll be nice looking, but they'll be not what you were looking for. So if we increase this to example, for example, to one, and we hit run over here, and then we go back to our max like, and we let it do the classifier again, we'll see probably I've pushed that too far. And now we only have four classes because I tried to keep these things too separated and it never could find six distinct classes. Now four is not enough for us. It, it may be, but it's not what we wanted. We wanted six, right? So what I have to do here is actually dial this back a notch. So if I go to 0.9, what happens, right? I think that's probably going to be too much again. Um, but let's just run it and see. Maybe it's going to be fine. And yeah, still four classes. So let's dial it back just a little bit more. Let's try point 0.8. Point 0.8 might be our good turning point when we do this the next time. Ah, you see, now we're back to our six classes. So essentially what we want to do is to get this number as high as possible before it flips to this to a different solution that we didn't want, right? And what that means is that the clusters that it's going to define are going to be tighter. They're going to be less noise in there. The edges are going to be more distinct. So for example, if we zoom in on this, they're going to be a little bit better. There's still some noise. You see these sort of isolated pixels and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, but by, but by Increasing this number to just the point before it flips, we're going to get the best possible clustering result, and that's what we want. Just a word of caution, if you, as you increase this number, you have to increase the number of iterations because it's going to take longer for it to converge on the proper uh, solution. The same thing, if you increase this number, you also have to increase the number of iterations. 1,000 is probably fine, and as you saw, even on my little laptop, it, it runs pretty quickly, so it's not a big computational cost. So we're pretty satisfied. I'm pretty satisfied with this. We would look now at our um, clustering report again, our spectral SIG file uh, that we were looking at before, and we would go through and find all the same, you know, clustering inputs that basically the percentage of the different or the, the, the means of the different bands for each cluster class, and we figure out what they're actually uh, telling us about. We can also use graphical information, so if we go back and forth between, let's say, our NDVI again, we can really see that whatever is in blue, class 2, probably has to do with healthy dark vegetation, and whatever is uh, class 1 has something also to do with vegetation, but probably dry and brown uh, vegetation, fallowed fields of some kind. And we have a class 3 seems to be sort of moderate vegetation, something like that. Maybe unirrigated or irrigated, something like that. And we have a few of these other classes over here, six and five, 
which again are probably different kinds of maybe natural vegetation, grasslands or scrub or something like that. So we have to use our intuition to figure out um, what we're going to do. So at this point we're basically done with our unsupervised classification. However, we can clean it up a little bit through a little bit of a trick. We can actually use this, these classes that we just defined as input training areas for a supervised classification. Now we could also draw little polygons and do it that way. That's a little bit involved and maybe that's for uh, uh, another day. But if we use this unsupervised output as input to a supervised classification, it's a little bit of a trick because it will start to clean up some of the boundaries and make a slightly nicer looking output. All right, so it's a little bit of a cheat in some ways, but it's actually a good way to get a slightly nicer looking unsupervised classification output. And the way we do it is pretty simple. We go back to our imagery uh, menu and we go down to our classify imaging uh, image output and we actually go to the input for supervised uh, classification, i.gensig. And it's actually very similar to the uh, I cluster, except it wants a ground truth training map. Like I said, this could be digitized by hand in areas that you know, they're farm fields or whatever, and you could just give it that way. You give it a number of input clusters, uh, classes, and then it will then use that to generate a signature file in from those training areas, which we can then put back into our maximum likelihood classifier over here. So in this case, it's real simple. We're just going to use our unsupervised classifier output as our ground truth training map. Pick our same uh, imagery group and our same imagery subgroup. And in this case, we're going to do sup signic sig, right? So supervised signatures for our output. And we're just going to click override again because we might want to do this once or twice. So we hit run. So we've got six input classes. It's calculating the class means and all the other stuff that it needs to send over here in the signature file. And there it is. We go back to our IMAX like, leave everything the same, except we're going to pick our new um, signature file here. Um, in fact, we may have to type it in by hand if we don't want to close this and open it again because it might not show up in the menu right away. So soup underscore sig. And here, we're gonna we're gonna do LSAT. I'm just gonna call it refined class because it's not technically the same thing as a real supervised classification. Uh, we're gonna hit run. And it's actually gonna be making a new map. Again, it's gonna by default apply the terrible Veritas, Veritas color scheme, I mean terrible for this kind of thing. So we're going to open our eye colors again, set color table, sorry, the R colors again. And this time under define, <coughs> just to make it easy on ourselves, instead of getting a new random one, we're actually going to just make it mat match our other, our unsupervised map. So it's going to be the same colors, right? So we're going to hit run. It's going to set the color scheme exactly the way it was before. Okay, so let's take a look at what that does for us. So here's our refined classes, and there's our original, right? So essentially you can see some of these little dots, these little noise areas here and here and here, are actually removed. Ah, so that's pretty nice, right? It just sort of looks a little bit better. And we can do this a couple of times. This is, this is really just a way of refining um, refining our output rather than making any new output, right? So all we would have to do is to go back, pick our uh, previous one, the one that we just made. Uh, so let's just go back over here to our IMAX like, and what did we call it? Landsat refined class, copy and paste it into the ground truth training, and supsig2, right? Hit run. done over here. Let's wait for it. Okay. Soup sig 2 LSAT refined class 2, right? Hit run and wait for the output.
We're going to reset our colors again. So we'll go back and we'll pick our refined class. Actually, two. Since it's not showing up there. Hit run. Change the colors back, right? And now we have three of them. So if we sort of step through. So this is our maybe most clean. Our least clean, cleaned, most clean. Right? So you can do this maybe a couple of times. It's easy to be go overkill on this. And really what we're doing is just removing some of the noise to make a slightly nicer looking output. And you see the difference between our final output and that output, especially in this area here. It just does a little bit of a better job of separating out some of those classes, right? So that's really cool. Um, and now what you want to do is make an output graphic with the, you know, class names. And then you got to write up your little report about what everything is here. So we have probably irrigated vegetation. And also, clearly, this is along a stream right here. You can see this pattern. So irrigated and riparian are put into the same class in this particular case. Um, then we have uh, healthy, but not possibly not irrigated vegetation. Uh, in the blue, right? And various types of sort of less healthy vegetation in the pink and in the light blue and all that kind of stuff, all right? So that's basically where we're at now for that um, routine of unsupervised classification and a little secret for how to clean it up and make it look nice. All right, see you next week.